Judge Ashley, we're getting a picture of what the state might end their case in chief on. Right now, they have been proffering evidence, jail calls, that this defendant made to his wife, to his mother. And how it all came about, they called the analyst to the stand who's there at the jail. She authenticated them, but then the defense objected to what was coming in. So the judge dismissed this jury for a little while, told them that it may be up to an hour, and we were able to listen to those calls outside the presence of the jury. Something the state said was important to bring up and why this was relevant is because it shows his mental state, how he oriented time when he's talking to his wife, and there's a portion of it where he says he's concerned about that confession he gave to police. Take a listen. You see it over and over in the Bible, how he says, and even in the Bible says, that he had power over all the nations. I mean, literally, he takes control over everything. Yeah, mama. Yes, yes. So we do, we all have the hope, right? We have what, baby? Hope. Oh, yeah. My, and I, when I pray to God and I tell him, you are my hope. Like, we are our hope. You are our strength. You are our hope. Like, that's all we have. And, 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 and at the end of the day, this is how I, I, and this is what I tell God. Like, our purpose in life, first and foremost, is to worship Him and to praise Him. Then the other stuff comes into play. And and, that's, and 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 my goal is is at the very end, like the light at the end of my tunnel, is when I am with Him for eternity. So um, so yo sé lo que él puede hacer. Lo que es imposible para uno, él lo puede hacer. I mean, he literally controls the whole world. Oh, I just want to make sure that we're all the same page. I know, sí, sí, mi amor. I have to say. We're all on the same page. Like, I don't see the point of going through the whole process. So. Well, that's very clear, mi amor. There's the trial. Okay. But if we're all on the same page, then okay. I'm very concerned over the statement that was made. I heard you have to turn to your to try to put this on president. And I don't think you're going to try to. Thank you, Mr. Moore. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You heard him there say the confession, something he's concerned about now that he's sitting in jail. This was just a couple of months after his arrest, and that was a conversation he had with his wife, Ashley. Wow. Well, how did the jury react? Before we get to some of the other points that stood out to you about what's happening today, how is the jury reacting? Because it's a little hard to hear the audio, but what significant audio to hear in his own voice? Well, actually, this is a proffer right now. So the jury was sent out. They are on a break because the judge, the defense rather, wanted to make sure the judge could hear it all and know exactly what the state planned to put in. They said they knew about all the jail calls, but they wanted to know which ones the state was actually going to play for the jury. So the jury hasn't heard it yet. But just for us in the courtroom, the victim's family members, you could see emotion from them because they're hearing a wife who's very genuine, kids on the call that was very genuine. Uh, but then you have this defendant who's asking about his trial and wanting to make sure everyone's on the same page in the family for how things are going to play out when this does get in front of a jury. Ooh, it is something else if it does get in front of that jury. All right, tell us about what's been happening today in front of the jury. Who all has testified? How close are we to seeing the state rest its case? The jury has had a lot to write about. They've been writing today because they've had a couple of analysts on the stand. At the very beginning of the day, we did hear the end of the uh, cross-examination of Ranger E.J. Salinas. So he testified yesterday. He came in today to be under cross and was challenged on whether or not they allowed the defendant to uh, ha maintain his rights, whether they violated those when they questioned him overnight, whether or not he had enough sleep, and whether they stopped questioning when he said that he didn't want to talk anymore. Then this jury has heard from two analysts with the Department of Public Safety. One of those, Sean Daniels, walked them through the ballistics in this case. There were shell casings that were found at the scene. There were also bullet projectiles uh, that were found inside of the bodies of these women. And he was able to show and give his conclusion to this jury that the nine casings and the projectiles 
could have come and in his opinion did get fired from the gun that belonged to the defendant. They've also heard the jury from a tr tire track analyst who confirmed that it's possible that the vehicle driven by this defendant created those tire tracks that were left at the scene of Claudine Luera. So a lot of forensic information they've been taking in today, but important to wrap up this state's case because it's the physical evidence that they can put on top of that confession that we know is hotly disputed by this defense. Right, that physical evidence and hearing about that, the tire track marks, the demonstrative aid so he could actually show show the jury what he was talking about with the bullet. I think that always makes a difference. So speaking of the confession, we know the defense has said, hey, that was coerced. It's, it's not a valid confession, jury. That's what you have to decide. And I know that the cross-examination of that ranger, Ranger Salinas, focused on whether or not it was voluntary. You, Julia, spoke with a false confessions expert. Do we expect such a similar expert to take the stand in this case? We actually don't. Uh, it's not something that we saw in the pretrial portion of this case, even though we keep hearing challenges to the confession. I talked to Professor Alan Hirsch with Williams College. He's someone who aired on court TV when we were covering the Skylar Richardson case, the cheerleader baby, baby murder trial, a woman who was acquitted of those charges after her defense called this expert to the stand. And he talked about why it's rare that false confession experts really get to take the stand in the numbers that he believes they should. There are a couple of reasons that courts supply. Uh, one is they claim the field of false confessions research is simply not developed enough. Uh, that increasingly is a hard position to maintain now that there is a voluminous literature and a great consensus on most of the major principles. Um, sometimes they say that we will simply confuse or overwhelm the jury and that letting us testify invades the jury's turf. And, you know, I don't find that convincing, especially because we do not go into court and say this confession is true or false. Instead, we educate the jury about the interrogation methods that were used in the particular case, what we know about them, and then the jury has to decide. Now, of course, Professor Hirsch is not an expert on this case, but I did give him some of the details that we've seen that we know the defense has raised on cross-examination, like the fact that this interrogation started at 3 a.m., ended at noon. This was a defendant who was taking PTSD medication and someone who the district attorney uh, was present in the building, and you had officers saying that they would put in a good word. He talked also about, or uh, talked to me about, this issue of whether or not the defendant asked or invoked his Fifth Amendment right to remain silent because he said, I don't want to talk to you, but then the conversation continued. Take a listen to his take on that portion of this confession. Uh, law enforcement gets around Miranda warnings all the time. Those kinds of gray areas where the defendant says no when asked, do you want to talk? But he doesn't say, I want a lawyer. He doesn't say the magic words, I invoke the Fifth Amendment. And if he doesn't say those words and they keep questioning him and then he starts talking, you're going to find most courts saying that he waived his rights. Do I approve of that? No. But does the court, do the courts, does the court system allow that? Yes. And Ashley, I want to leave you with the statistic that the professor gave to me. He said when there are confessions that are later proven after a trial that they could not have been correct because DNA evidence or something shows that this person was innocent, 75% of the time, juries did convict that person. So perhaps without much other evidence than that confession. Wow, uh, what an interview and statistics to share with our viewers because that's significant. We know this defendant again is saying, no, it was a coerced confession. So I must ask you before I let you go, Julie, I know they're in court, but do we know whether or not the defendant, Mr. Ortiz, is going to testify yet? We don't know for sure. We've been asking those questions of our sources in the courthouse and also of the defense team. They've said that their case will wrap up pretty quickly. So if the state rests today, 
They said that on Wednesday is when they expect to uh, be done with their portion of the case if they have any witnesses. And oftentimes we hear that from the defense if they know that they can't say that they have no witnesses because there's always the chance that the defendant can take the stand up until the time that the judge asks do you want to take the stand in your own defense? So we'll be watching for that. It hasn't been taken completely off the table, but we don't even know what evidence they may put on, if any, which they're not required to do. Right, I love that reminder. You know, innocent until proven guilty. The defense doesn't have to put on any evidence. The prosecution has to prove it beyond a reasonable doubt. Julia Cheney, thank you so much for joining us with all your great live updates.